Good evening. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called at baptism. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. On this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter the celebration of the great three days reconciled with God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in singing Three Day Holy Days and Fold Us Now. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter. 
Israel remembered its deliverance from slavery in Egypt by celebrating the festival of Passover. This festival featured the Passover lamb whose blood was used as a sign to protect God's people from the threat of death. The early church described the Lord's Supper using imagery from the Passover, especially in portraying Jesus as the lamb who delivers God's people from sin and death. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You will keep it on the 14th day of the month when the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You will celebrate it as a festival of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Our psalm is Psalm 116, which we will sing antiphonally by verse.
The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. In the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper, we experience intimate fellowship with Christ and with one another because it involves his body given for us and the new covenant in his blood. Faithful participation in this meal is a living proclamation of Christ's death until he comes in the future. For I received from the Lord what I was also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this for remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John. The story of the Last Supper in John's Gospel recalls a remarkable event not mentioned elsewhere. Jesus performs the duty of a slave, washing the feet of his disciples and urging them to do the same for one another. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around them. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have sent you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am only with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, so quiz time. How many people here, by show of hands, know what the word mondi is? M-A-U-N-D-Y, Maundy Thursday means. 
Anybody, anybody? No? Not even you, Maya? You've heard me talk about it all these years? <laughs> That's okay. I didn't know until I went to seminary, and why would you know something like that unless you went to something like seminary? So what does Mondi mean? Well, Mondi is Latin for mandatum. I think that's how you say it. I'm not a Latin scholar, so I don't really know. But it means command. And Jesus commands us to observe this day. So just what is it that Jesus is commanding us to do? Is Jesus commanding us to wash feet? Well, you'll be relieved that that's not exactly it. Although we will be washing two young people's feet in preparation for their first communion, and we're all excited about that. That'll happen later on in the service. But the point of this whole text is tucked up in those first couple of verses. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then at the end of the passage we hear, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. So, what's our commandment? What's our mandatum? To love one another. Because by this, everyone will know that you are a follower of Christ. If you have the love that Christ had for one another. And Jesus begins and ends this passage, and even his life, as an outpouring of love. Now, just like in communion, the pastor is served last by an acolyte or a communion assistant. Jesus, when you think about it, well, he had his feet washed too, but his were washed before anyone else's. In fact, his feet may have still smelt of Mary's anointing. He was gathered in a room with other people at dinner, and here comes this woman, and she unties and unbinds her hair, which was just, like, scandalous and shocking. And you wonder why Jesus would allow someone, much less a woman, to touch him in such an intimate way in a public setting. It, just, it was breaking and defying all of the rules, and just, it just wasn't done. But Jesus understood her intentions and her meaning, and he says to those who are gathered with him, she has prepared my body for burial. She literally pours out her love for him and her costly gift of ointment. They say that that ointment would have uh, paid the wages of many workers for a year. And in her tears, as her tears fall on his feet and she wipes them away with her hair. So Jesus is literally smelling of her love. And he takes a towel and he ties it around his waist. Now those towels that you see stacked there on the, um, the baptismal font area, those wouldn't tie around my waist. They wouldn't fit. But the stole that I wear, it symbolizes that first towel. So... Uh, when you see a pastor in that stole that they wear that makes them distinctive from others, it is a symbol of service and not of superiority. God calls ministers to be first servants and shepherds of the people of God. So Jesus, he kneels before his disciples and he takes on the submissive position of a servant and pours water over their feet and wipes them with a towel. In text study this week, some of the pastors were wondering if it was sort of like you come in and, you know, your host might offer to take your coat and, you know, you just take off your coat and hand it to them and you don't even really think about it. Well, there were people that would come and wash the dust from traveling off of your feet. And so they might have, like, been sticking their feet out and getting their feet cleaned up and looked down and like, wait a minute, that's Jesus. What's Jesus doing there? That's not what he's supposed to do. And this is how Jesus chose to contemplate his death and to help prepare those around him to begin to prepare for the days when he would be gone. And he does it in this 
act of loving and tender service and devotion. Now, I haven't ever had to contemplate my death, but I've been with quite a few people who have been in that position. And I remember this one family, I um, was... I wasn't even a full-fledged chaplain yet. I was just training and uh, learning to be a chaplain. And so every time that I knew that I was going to go and be with a family who was getting ready for a death, I took a deep swallow and I thought, who am I to go in and be with this family in such a personal and intimate way? I'm just a kid. What what do I have that I can offer and, and give to these people? And I'd always feel... A little nervous so I came and I walked up to the door and I paused and before I can even get my spiel out you know I'm chaplain Kara and I'm here from the hospital and blah 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 they see me and they say hey do you sing and I was like oh well yeah actually I I do sing all right my my whole family sings and so then they scoot over on this little bench and they pat this little tiny space next to them And I popped down and were pressed in there, four bodies in this little tiny love seat. And I am as close to another person as you can get. And I don't even know these people's names. And they plop a songbook in my lap. And they say, we're going to sing Daddy out through their tears. They say, we've always sung as a family. And they started in with a great classical old hymn, the family breaking into four-part harmony that you could tell that they were all so comfortable in. This is something that they had done many, many times. And it was so glorious and so sweet, it would just make angels cry. And this was the special way that this family wanted to be together, all together, one last time. And their songs were an act of love. And I think this was the the feeling that Jesus wanted. He wanted to say goodbye with an act of love to the people that were closest to him. (coughs) Excuse me. And then Jesus comes to Peter. And as they would say in the South, Peter, bless his heart, names the obvious. It's not proper for Jesus to be at his feet. Jesus is the master. Jesus is the rabbi. Jesus is the son of man. Jesus is the Messiah. He should be sitting high on a throne in a resplendent throne room, not taking on the stance of a servant. And then Jesus says this curious thing, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Jesus loved them to the end. Jesus made that love visible, made that love sacramental by washing the disciples' feet. And this love and this washing caused others to share something pretty important with Jesus. Relationship and love and grace and abundant, everlasting life. In short, salvation. Now think about this. Jesus washed everyone's feet that was there, including Judas's. There was nothing that Judas could do that would undo Jesus' act of love. Peter denies Jesus three times, and upon the rock, which is what Peter means, Jesus later goes on to build the church. Judas betrays Jesus, and some people feel that Judas commits the unforgivable sin in betraying Jesus. But I have my wonders about that. And you know, everybody thinks that Judas betrays Jesus when he meets him in the garden. He kisses him on the cheek in order to let the Roman soldiers know that this was Jesus of Nazareth. But actually, he abandons his relationship with Jesus. In this um, retelling of the gospel, at least, Jesus turns himself in. But Judas abandons Jesus when Judas leaves and goes out into the darkness. In Matthew, Judas repents. 
His suicide is a tragedy, yes. But we don't know what went through Judas's heart and mind in those moments. And I believe that a good and loving God would have some way that all could be forgiven and reconciliation could still be a possibility. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't know. I think, I think that God could forgive. Judas turns his back on Jesus and he turns his back on God. But is that enough for Judas to be separated from the love of God? And I believe that that reconciliation is always available, whether in this life or in the life everlasting. And I believe that Judas needs to be included in today's memory because haven't we all in some form or fashion turned our back on our Lord? Haven't we all been among the crowd shouting crucify him? Don't we all make choices that cause us to reject the intimacy and relationship and love that Jesus offers. I believe in part that's why we celebrate Lent. That's why we're here today to remember and reflect on our own role in the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus' love was so vast that he was willing to die so that we wouldn't have to. Those of us in the past, those of us here in the present, and those of us yet to come, Yes, we all find a time when our, here, our life here on earth comes to an end, but that's not our end, and that we continue on for eternity in the loving arms of our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in God, our Creator and Maker, and in the Holy Spirit that fills us and gives us life. You see, there can't be resurrection without death. Parts of us need to die in order for new life to spring forward within us. When I moved here, um, there was a rhubarb plant over up at the parsonage, and it's a perennial, because if it wasn't a perennial, it would be dead, because I'm kind of a love them and leave them girl when it comes to plants, just ask Maya. And every year, that plant grows brown, and it withers, and it crumbles away, and yet, somehow, this thing that just, it seems dead, it seems devoid of life, but somehow every year, these little green, little furls and folds of leaf begin to uncurl. And you're like, oh, hang on, little plant, I think there's a couple more episodes of snow, don't freeze to death. And it doesn't. And every year it comes back. And every year, the, the bulbs that someone planted up there, they shoot forth with these bright pink flowers. And every year, there's a plant that gets this round purple globe that has these little fingers that protrude out. Year after year after year, they come back in this place that seems so dead and lifeless. And in a, just a little tiny, small way, they point to a little resurrection. And so now when we come to our final death, we can cling to the hope of the promise that this is truly not the end, that there is more to come, that Jesus sets a powerful example for us to go and do as he does, which sets thousands of little deaths into motion. If I'm to love my neighbor as myself, I need to let die that my comfort and my desires and my time are more important than my neighbor's need. Neighbor love, when done right, always leads to suffering of some kind. It's kind of a hard sell of Christianity. But loving our neighbors also places us in the presence of God. For wherever two or more are gathered in Christ's name, God is with us. This afternoon, I went to go see Bob Bender, who uh, many of you know, but not all of you do. And he's an older gentleman, and he's very reserved and has a certain dignity and bearing about him. And today, for the first time, he met me at the elevator, and he had his arms open. And I came in, and he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him, hugging him very, very carefully, because he's become so frail. But we exchanged this this greeting and this affection that has grown over the time 
that we've known each other. And that is just such a beautiful, holy moment of God. We don't do this work alone. God puts people into our lives. And God invites others to come and show up in our lives in surprising ways. And we're often startled that God is already at work in places and in people that we would never suspect. Later in scripture, we hear of Stephen who meets an Ethiopian eunuch who of all things is reading Isaiah. But he needs someone to explain it to him. So the two engage in the story, and the story ends with the Ethiopian saying, well, what would stop me from receiving baptism? And Stephen thinks, and he's like, hmm, there really isn't any reason why you couldn't be baptized. And the Ethiopian, he sees some water and he pulls the carriage over and tells him to stop. And the two men get out and they go into the water. And Stephen baptizes this man. To love and serve God is so satisfying and fulfilling and our hearts are restless until they rest in God. So today is Maundy Thursday and we hear from Jesus' own lips. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. It's not about getting a spiritual high from ancient liturgy, as this geeky preacher girl often does. It's not about doing things the way we've always done them, because that's what we've always done. It's not about reenacting the Last Supper. It's about love. And not the hallmark, rom-com, meet-cute tropes and stereotypes, but the kind of love that's willing to suffer, the kind of love that pierces your heart, the kind of love that pours out your entire self for the sake of someone hurting, someone in need, the kind of love that takes a person by the hand and helps them find their way back to all of our Creator, in whom we all live and move and have our being. May it be so for you and for me, my friends. Amen. So at this time, we um, will be having our foot washing, and I would invite Noah and Katrina to come up, and we have plenty of time. So just find one of the pews up here in front, and you can take off either one or both of your shoe or shoes and socks. And um, at the right time, I'll ask you to, to come forward. On this night, we have heard our Lord's commandment to love one another as he has loved us. We who receive God's love in Christ Jesus are called to love one another, to be servants to each other as Christ becomes our servant. Our commitment to this loving service is signified in the washing of feet, following the example our Lord gave us on the night before his death.
Trusting in Jesus who gave his life for the world, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, who kneels to wash our feet, gather your church around the world during this holy week. Humble the powerful and lift up any who are marginalized. Renew our faith and make us bold in service and love to our neighbors. Merciful God, God, who blesses the grain of the soil and the fruit of the vine, inspire in us a reverent care for the earth. Sustain fields, gardens, and wild places that all people are fed and every living thing flourishes. Merciful God, God, whose greatest commandment is love, guide all who govern by the principle of love. Transform unjust human systems that oppress some for the gain of others. Restore communities as places of justice and concern for those who are vulnerable. Merciful God, God who was betrayed, comfort people everywhere who have suffered abuse at the hands of someone they knew and trusted. Heal the bodies, minds, and hearts of victims of exploitation. Help all in pain to know that you are near. Merciful God, God who sits at the table with us, grant us the joy of your presence to people celebrating First Communion today, Katrina Nixt and Noah Smith, and to all who share the meal, strengthen communities of faith and grace and courage. Merciful God, God who brings new life out of death, we pray with thanks for the lives of those who have joined the communion of saints. And our holy meal connect us to the faithful who have gone before us and nourish us as your people living today. Merciful God, receive these prayers, loving God, for the sake of the one who loved us to the end, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And, also with you. and take a moment to share with one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross transforming death into life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Just a couple of words of instruction. At the start of our communion, I'll invite forward first Noah and his family, and then Katrina and her family. You'll receive communion as a group, and then ushers at the, after that time, then you can help the rest of our congregation receive communion. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace. And receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and to be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
At this time, I'd like to invite Mason to come up, and I'll need one other person that can hold the basket for us. Is there anyone that would be willing to volunteer? Okay, one of you, Grant or Garrett, I don't care, one of you can come. And Noah, if you would like to come forward at this time with your family. The little kneeler right here in front for you, Noah. And then your family can kneel or stand next to you. Well, you guys have to take communion first.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.